Um, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. Um, yeah. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mary. Let's, uh, let's take a moment to pray as we come to God's word. Father, we praise and thank you today for your word. We thank you that you speak to us through it. And Father, as we look at this theme of grace today, we just pray that you will give us a deeper understanding of your grace, that we would receive it in a fresh way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been following the news over this past week, you'll know that on Monday night, just two days after the terrible tragedy at Bondi Junction last Saturday, a bishop in the Orthodox Assyrian Church in Sydney was attacked and injured while he was delivering a sermon. And news of this attack spread quickly on social media and a crowd gathered outside the church, a crowd from the community gathered outside the church and some in that crowd engaged in violent behaviour. In fact, for the next several hours, they caused injury to dozens of police officers, massive property damage, while many hid inside the church in fear, including some first responders. The church has unequivocally condemned this behaviour and called for calm and peace, as you would expect. But on Thursday, Bishop Murray Emanuel spoke publicly for the first time from his hospital bed. And after assuring everyone that he was doing well and in fact recovering quite quickly, he addressed his church members and followers whom he calls his beloved faithfuls. It's a rather endearing term, isn't it? He recorded a message and in that message, he gave this piece of advice for all his beloved faithfuls. He said, I need you to act Christ-like. The Lord Jesus never taught us to fight. The Lord Jesus never taught us to retaliate. The Lord Jesus never said to us an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The Lord Jesus said, never, never said return evil with evil, but return evil with good. He said, above all, we are Christians and we need to act like it. And then he had a message for his attacker, for the 16-year-old young man that attacked him. And here's what he said. I forgive whoever has done this act. And I say to him, you are my son. I love you and I will always pray for you. And whoever sent you to do this, I forgive them as well in Jesus' mighty name. And then he said this to him, may the Lord Jesus forgive you. May the Lord Jesus bless you and show you the way, my dear son. What a powerful example of grace. Now, I don't know much about this bishop or the church, but this week he has responded from a grace-filled heart. And friends, over the next two weeks, we're going to consider our own hearts and lives and ask the question, do we reflect 
the grace of God to others. And today, our theme is a grace-filled heart, and next week, we'll look at grace-filled lives. So I'd love you to have uh, your Bible open, to have that passage that Mary just read to us in Luke chapter 15, to have that open in front of you as we begin by looking at the grace-filled heart of Jesus. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Beginning in verse 1. We read, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, before we keep reading, we need to stop right here for a moment. Tax collectors and sinners were drawn to Jesus. They wanted to hear his teaching. Does that strike you? I mean, if we're somewhat familiar with the Gospels and with the life of Jesus, then of course, it doesn't really surprise us at all. But let's not forget who these people are. Tax collectors were some of the most hated and despised people in society at this time. They weren't trusted and for good reason. I wonder who you would consider to be the least trustworthy people in our society today. Well, in 2022, the Governance Institute of Australia conducted a survey on ethics to find out which occupations Australians consider to be the most trustworthy and the least trustworthy. Now, of no great surprise, nurses and emergency services, fire and ambulance were the top three most trusted professions in Australia. Do you want to see who the least, least trustworthy were? You can probably guess. I'm not sure if you can read that on the screen there, but... <laughs> State politicians, federal politicians, real estate agents, that's a worry because I was one of those once, local politicians, lawyers, corporate executives, fund managers, and mortgage brokers. Well, sadly, there's probably not too many surprises in that list either. I do notice, though, that our modern-day tax collector, the Australian Tax Office, is not listed there, which I think is a good thing. Clearly, we've made some progress. But if this survey was conducted in the Roman Empire of the first century, tax collectors would be right up there among the least trustworthy occupations. They had a reputation for dishonesty, for corruption, for greed, exploiting the people for excessive profits. They were despised by the Jews for both their fraud and their collusion with Rome. And any Jew who was a tax collector for the Roman Empire was considered a traitor by the Jewish leaders. In fact, just a few chapters later in the Gospel of Luke, they grouped with robbers, evildoers and adulterers. Here they grouped with sinners, most likely because that's how the religious leaders, such as the Pharisees, we're going to see in a moment, referred to them and the other sorts of people that were gathering around to hear Jesus. It seems this term sinner was a term used for anyone, Jew or Gentile, who didn't keep God's law, particularly as the religious leaders interpreted it. From those who didn't practice their strict purity rituals through to those who committed more obvious public sins. And yet, these are the very people that were drawn to Jesus. Why? What was it about Jesus that attracted them to him? This begs a challenging question for us personally, doesn't it? Are the tax collectors and sinners of our day drawn to us? Now, the religious leaders weren't happy about this at all. Have a look there at verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law 
muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You see, it's bad enough that these people are attracted to Jesus, but what's even worse is that he eats with them. He has table fellowship with them. To the Pharisees, this is scandalous. They wouldn't do this. They likely followed an old rabbinic teaching which said, the wise, the wise say, let not, a man, let not a man associate with sinners even to bring them near the Torah. In other words, even to bring them near to God and near to his Lord. You don't even eat with people for that purpose. In Eastern cultures back then and still today, table fellowship is a big deal. It implies mutual acceptance. As one commentator puts it, meals become a means of establishing clear boundaries that showed who was in and who was out. And the tax collectors and sinners are not keeping God's law. And so as far as the Pharisees, they're out. And you certainly don't eat with them. Another commentator helps us understand what a big deal this was. The words have come up on the screen. He says, no act apart from participation in the actual sinful deeds of the guests could have broken the wall of separation more dramatically. And it's possible that Jesus himself was at times not just a guest, but even the host of the meal. This may be what the Pharisees are implying when they mutter that he welcomes or receives sinners. And that's even more scandalous because to invite someone to be a guest at a meal was to honour them. So why would Jesus do this? Why would he be associating himself with such people? The Pharisees, in fact, are, are probably implying here that because Jesus associates with them, he's no different to them. He's no better than they are. And so why would he make himself vulnerable to such accusation and put his reputation at risk? Well, he goes on to tell three parables to defend his actions. And today we're just going to look at the first two, the parable the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. First, the lost sheep there in verses 3 to 7. Now remember, as we look at these, that both the Pharisees and the tax collectors and sinners are listening to what Jesus is about to say. Come with me to verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? What's the answer that Jesus anticipates here? Of course he does. Of course he does. That's what shepherds do. They care for the sheep. Every sheep is valuable. Every sheep is of commercial value. When the shepherds do their nightly count at the end of the day, if one is missing... They're going to go and search for it and try and find it. Verse 5. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Has anyone carried a sheep on their shoulders before? Yes. Yes. This is amazing me. I expected at all three services today to get a no. I've got a yes at every, every single service. That's impressive. Apparently, these sheep can weigh up to 30 kilograms. And that's quite some weight to have hanging around your neck, isn't it? But how does the shepherd respond when he finds the sheep and he knows he's got to put it on his shoulders and carry it home? He rejoices. He joyfully puts it on his shoulders to carry it home. It's going to be hard work. It's going to take great effort, but he does it joyfully. And that's not the only time he rejoices. When he gets home, he calls his friends and neighbours together and they have a big party and celebrate because that which was lost 
has now been found. The sheep has been restored to the shepherd and to the flock. And then he tells the second parable of the lost coin, which is very similar in verses 8 to 10. Verse 8. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. Now this lost silver coin is worth about a day's wages. And this woman is likely to be poor, possibly living in a small one-room hut. If she's married, it's possible that the 10 silver coins are the dowry that she brought into the marriage, which is, and if that's the case, that's all that belongs to her. Even if the marriage ends, that is all that she owns. Each one of these 10 coins is valuable to her. And if she loses one, of course, she goes looking for it and finding it again is great cause for celebration. She too calls her friends and neighbours together and they celebrate. I wonder if you can think of something that you own, something that is precious and valuable to you, that if you lost it, you would search high and low until you found it. And it would cause you to be really happy and joyful and excited once you found it. And then at the end of each of these parables, Jesus gives the punchline. First in verse 7, after the parable of the lost sheep, here's the point. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And then again in verse 10, after the parable of the lost coin, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God rejoices greatly when the lost are found. So why does Jesus welcome sinners and eat with them? Because it's the expression of the very reason for which he came. And this is summed up so well by theologian Joachim Jeremias. Sounds like a biblical name, doesn't it? In which case I have to pronounce it differently. But here's what he said. I think this sums it up so well. Jesus' meals with the publicans and sinners are an expression of his mission and message. The inclusion of sinners in the community of salvation achieved in table fellowship is the most meaningful expression of the message of the redeeming love of God. Jesus is doing God's mission. As he himself said a few chapters later in the home of another, of a, a chief tax collector in the home of Zacchaeus, he said he came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is searching for lost sheep. He's spending his time and effort and focus and priority on searching for them and he longs to find them and put them on his shoulders and carry them home. We have this beautiful picture of God as a shepherd in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11 in the Old Testament. Listen as I read this. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And so why were the tax collectors and sinners drawn to Jesus? Because they knew that he was a shepherd just like that. They knew that he had a grace-filled heart. They could tell. They could feel it. 
They experienced it in his welcome and in his interactions with them. They experienced it in his table fellowship and his meals with them. They knew. But the Pharisees, they completely missed it. They think that they're the righteous ones who don't need to repent, that Jesus mentions there in verse 7. But I think there's some irony in the statement that Jesus makes there. He's not saying that some people are so righteous that they don't need to repent. Everyone is lost, including the Pharisees. Everyone is a sinner and needs God's grace. Everyone needs to repent and receive forgiveness of sins. The difference between the tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees is the tax collectors and sinners know they're lost. But the Pharisees don't. So how about you? And how about me? And how about us as a church community? Are our hearts full of grace for the lost like the heart of Jesus? Do we value and seek out the lost like God does? Do we rejoice and celebrate when the lost are found? Or are we more like the Pharisees? Friends, today I just want to leave you with one application point. Because there's only one way to have a grace-filled heart like the heart of Jesus. And here it is. It's to dive deeper into God's grace for you. If we find ourselves thinking or behaving like the Pharisees towards others or even towards God, then the gospel of grace has not penetrated our hearts deeply. Grace doesn't come naturally to the human heart, does it? What comes naturally is to repay evil with evil. And if we lose sight of the gospel of grace, we're in danger of falling into one of two errors. The first error is moralism. After being a Christian for a while, we can easily fall back into moralism. This is the error of the Pharisees. Somewhere in our hearts, we think God accepts us because of our good works, our moral behavior. And so we pride ourselves on our good character. Somewhere deep in our hearts, we're trying to earn God's love, earn His favour by our good life. And if we think we're doing okay, especially as we compare ourselves to others, we might even come to feel like that in some way we deserve God's love and acceptance. If we find ourselves thinking that we're better than others, looking down on others who struggle with sins that are different to the sins we struggle with, then we've fallen prey to moralism. The second error that we can fall prey to is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a theologian and church leader that lived during the time of the Second World War. And he explains cheap grace like this. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Cheap grace is grace without the cross. And friends, if our view of grace is cheap grace, then it's not really grace at all. Because it means that we don't take sin seriously, that we think it's no big deal. Bishop Emmanuel, in extending grace to the man who attacked him, is not in any way diminishing or dismissing the wrong that was done to him. 
True grace means we take sin seriously. Cheap grace means we think to ourselves, I know I shouldn't sin, but it'll be okay. If I just say sorry afterwards, God will forgive me. That's what I used to think when I was a lot younger. I used to think, I used to have this mindset of cheap grace. I didn't understand true repentance. But friends, true grace, God's grace, is costly grace. Yes, it's offered to us freely. We can't earn it and we certainly don't deserve it, but it's not cheap. It cost him everything. It came at great cost, at infinite cost. Jesus is the shepherd that ultimately laid down his life for the sheep. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Friends, diving deeply into God's grace for us means taking our sin seriously, facing it honestly and repenting of it regularly. Diving deeply into God's grace for us means trusting and rejoicing in God's gifts of forgiveness and new life. And diving deeply into God's grace for us means that we desire to live a moral life, a life that pleases God, not to earn His love and acceptance, but because He's already accepted, because He already loves us and has already accepted us in Christ and we seek to please him in grateful response, in grateful thanks for his love and acceptance of us in Jesus. Friends, the only way for you and I to have a grace-filled heart for others after the grace-filled heart of God is to dive deeper into God's grace for us. On February 21, 2018, at the age of 99, the great evangelist Billy Graham died. Some of you here tonight might not know who Billy Graham is or a lot about him, particularly those of you who are younger, but Billy Graham dedicated his life to proclaiming the good news of the love and grace of God in Jesus Christ all across the world. He preached in 85 countries on six continents, with the largest crowd being this one, in Seoul, in South Korea in 1973, with an estimated 1.1 million people in attendance. In fact, he still holds the record for the largest crowd ever to fill the MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, in 1959, estimated to be 140,000 people within those grounds. I watched his funeral service, which was live-streamed online. And of course, many people, including his family members, shared stories of their relationship with him and their memories of him. And one of his daughters, by the name of Ruth, in fact, the same name as his wife, shared a story about her father. And I want to show you that story on video now. Check out the screens. But I have my own Billy Graham story. So I'm going to tell you that one. And I've told it many times, and some of you have maybe heard it many times. But it bears repeating because to me it speaks to the essence of who my father was and is. After 21 years, my marriage ended in divorce. I was devastated. I floundered. I did a lot wrong. The rug was pulled out from under me. My family thought it'd be a good idea for me to move away, to get a fresh start somewhere else. So I decided to live near my older sister and her family and near a good church. 
The pastor of that church introduced me to a handsome widower, and we began to date fast and furiously. My children didn't like him, but I thought, you know, they were almost grown. They didn't know what they could, they couldn't tell me what to do. I knew what was best for my life. My mother called me from Seattle. My father called me from Tokyo. They said, honey, why don't you slow down? Let us wait to get to know this man. They had never been a single parent. They had never been divorced. What did they know? So being stubborn, willful, and sinful, I married a man, this man, on New Year's Eve. And within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. After five weeks, I fled. I was afraid of him. What was I going to do? I wanted to go talk to my mother and my father. It was a two-day drive. Questions swirled in my mind. What was I going to say to daddy? What was I going to say to mother? What was I going to say to my children? I'd been such a failure. What were they going to say to me? You, we, we're tired of fooling with you. We told you not to do it. You've embarrassed us. And let me tell you, you women will understand you don't want to embarrass your father. You really don't want to embarrass Billy Graham. <laughs> and many of you know that we live on the side of a mountain. And as I wound myself up the mountain, I rounded the last bend in my father's driveway, and my father was standing there waiting for me. As I got out of the car, he wrapped his arms around me and he said, welcome home. There was no shame, there was no blame, there was no condemnation, just unconditional love. And you know, my father was not God, but he showed me what God was like that day. When we come to God with our sin, our brokenness, our failure, our pain and our hurt, God says, welcome home. And that invitation is open for you. Thank you and God bless you. Friends, that's what a grace-filled heart looks like. Have you experienced grace like that? We all long to experience grace like that, don't we? From other human beings, let alone from God. That day, Ruth Graham experienced God's grace for her through the grace-filled heart of her father. Have you received God's grace for you? It's the only way that we will ever experience true freedom and joy. No matter what we've done, no matter what sins we've committed, no matter what is in our past, the only way to experience true freedom and to experience true joy is to experience and receive the grace and forgiveness of God. And you can receive it today. Those of you, you watching on the live stream, you can receive it today. You can know His love and acceptance. You can know the joy and the freedom of having your sins forgiven the joy of knowing Him, knowing your Creator, the joy of new life and hope. And as Ruth said, the way you receive it is by humbly coming to God in all your sin, in all your brokenness, in all your failure, accepting His forgiveness and trusting Him as Saviour and Lord. Nothing would bring God greater joy and for you to receive his grace. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while, but you've fallen into moralism or cheap grace. Maybe you're still struggling to accept God's love and forgiveness. Maybe there's something in your past and it keeps coming up over and over again. It keeps eating away at you. It keeps niggling at you and you maybe even subconsciously living in such a way that you're trying to pay for your sin, that you're trying to earn God's love and favour and forgiveness.
Friends, God is standing at the top of his driveway. He's waiting there with arms open wide, waiting for you to come to him, waiting to welcome you home. Will you come? I'm going to give you a moment just in quiet to come before God and to come to him wherever you're at in life, whether it's coming to receive his grace for the first time or for the thousandth time. I give you a moment to respond in your heart and to run into the arms of your grace-filled Father. If you've never responded and received God's grace, his gift of salvation that he offers to you and you'd like to do that today, you might like to pray this prayer in your heart after me. There's no magic in these words. This is just a way of expressing your heart to God. Repenting of your sin and trusting in him as your saviour. You might like to pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I come to you in my sin and brokenness and failure. Thank you for giving your life for me and bearing the cost of my sin on the cross. Please forgive me and wash me clean. I turn away from my sin and living my own way and I turn to you, trusting you as my Lord and Saviour. Transform me by your grace and help me to live for you. Amen. And Father... For those of us who, in all honesty, can identify with the Pharisees, perhaps our lives reflect more moralism than they do your grace, or maybe we've been, we've had this view, this cheap view of grace. Father, we pray today as we run into your arms that you would surround us with your love and that we would receive your grace afresh. Father, help us never to forget the cost of our salvation. What it cost you, what it cost your son Jesus to purchase forgiveness on our behalf so you can offer it to us as a free gift. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. And please help us to dive deeper into it so that we don't try and live a good life to somehow earn your love and favour, as absurd as that even is. But Father, allow your grace to penetrate our hearts so deeply that we can't help but respond in thankfulness, in praise, in gratitude, as we seek to live for you, not for your love and acceptance, but because you have already loved and accepted us fully in Jesus. And Father, may your grace flow through us to others. May people be drawn and attracted to us as they were to Jesus, not because of anything in us, but because He's in us, because His light shines through us. 
continue to transform us so we become more and more like Him. Use us, we pray, as you continue to seek after lost sheep. We thank you for your love and care for us who once were lost, but now we have found. May that be true for so many other people in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Jesus promised Savior, humble servant Fill my heart with wonder, joyous praise I bring. The blessed and only ruler, Lord of everything. With all my heart I love you, my soul to you. my deliverer, the Son who sets me free, sovereign King of all the earth, you rule majestically, miracles and wonders, your mighty acts I see, I worship and adore you, and gladly bow.